Welcome to the Mental Insights Podcast. This is a community aimed at understanding all sides of mental health, addiction, and homelessness. Each interview will include either a personal story or an expert's advice within one of these fields. The goal of this project is to promote awareness, guidance, and support for anyone who is affected by these challenges. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for listening to the Mental Insights Podcast. This is your host, Brennan Catulli. We are here for part two of episode two, season two of the Mental Insights Podcast. We are here with Bill Protzman. Thank you, Bill, for being back here. We're going to be speaking about music as a tool for growth. To really start off, I think there's, you know, kind of a definition in place that we need to go about in terms of really what music can do, what kind of impact it can have within our mind. From the National Alliance of Mental Illness, they stated that music engages the neocortex of our brain, which calms us and reduces impulsivity. Can you explain more about this and how kind of music interacts within our brain and what that kind of plays within our care and, you know, this next step that we want to use music as a tool for growth? I love this question. The, uh, the cool thing about music is that it happens before we think about it. And to sort of explain that in terms of the brain, music works on a, on a real base part of our brain, like the lizard brain. Some people call it the crocodile brain. But the part that is not our cortex where we think, it starts way down there in, in the brain that is common to like all life out there. Lizards have it. Crocodiles have it. When you hear something, that's what gets triggered. And the purpose of the amygdala and some other stuff that's in that part of the brain is to prepare us physically for whatever that trigger was. So let's say that trigger is a gunshot. That's a pretty good one. When your body gets the signal gunshot, which your ears have picked up, uh, things change. You get tense. Like you immediately feel some adrenaline. Um, your heart rate increases. Your breath, might, your breathing right, might increase a little bit. That's all taken care of long before you actually recognize that you heard a gunshot. So your system is already primed and ready. And then you're thinking about it. And there's literally about 100 times longer. So it's in microseconds but or milliseconds. But by the time you think that you heard a gunshot, your body's ready to respond. Fight, flight, freeze, whatever those basic responses are. And (laughs) once you recognize you heard a gunshot, you can go, oh, well, that was a gunshot. That's really weird. Who's shooting a gun around the neighborhood at this time of the morning? Or you go, oh my gosh, I better take cover. They might be shooting at me. So you have some choices. The idea there is you're thinking about it now, right? So uh, all music is that way. It reaches us on a very basic level. And our systems respond way before we actually think about it and go, oh yeah, that's fish. Is that something new? I never heard that before. So, right? So you're already responding to it. And we feel that often as like or dislike. I think that's the easiest way of, of understanding it here. Some music hits us, we go, hey, I like that. What's that? Or some music hits us, we go, oh, I don't like that one. And our body is giving us that signal so that our thought can engage. And usually our thought engages by running what we've heard through a belief system or through a list of things we've heard in the past. I mean, we're pretty good at this. We compute our response based upon the sounds. But by the time we've done that, we're already primed and ready to do something about it, which is why music is so great for things like exercise and dance music, I mean, stuff that triggers adrenaline, we really feel that, we really get that. More subtle forms of music, they do the same thing, like classical music, it does the same thing. But it's just not as easy to, to, to dig into it and unpack what's happened there, even though the same effect has already happened. Isn't that cool? It, it really is, and it's great that different types of genres, different types of you know kinds of music can have other types of benefits. There can be so many different ways that we can use music to heal different challenges that somebody might face. Within kind of just an overarching um, aspect of music care in terms of the benefits that you do see, whether it's mental, physical, emotional, what are kind of the main benefits that you see right off the surface within music in general and its interaction within someone? A lot of them are really obvious, like you can tell the adrenaline rush when you're on the dance floor. But the, the curious thing about music is that it isn't just one effect. Music hurt, it affects us physically and mentally. We've talked about 
It also, of course, affects us emotionally. And then there's all the other stuff that we don't know yet that I call spiritual. So there's that spiritual effect of music too. And while the predominant effect might be one that makes you want to dance, the other three are still there as well. Like when you hear that house music and you just want to get up and move. Yeah, you're physically responding to that, but there's also like an excitement that's happened and you've got the, an emotional response to that too. And then in my case anyway, the fear kicks in because I'm like, oh, geez, you know, it's been a while since I danced. <laughs> so <laughs> you wonder about how you're going to look to other people, right? That, that, so that's all part of it too. But the spiritual connection, like you get to dance with somebody else. You get to make a connection of some kind of human connection takes place. What is it that's like, is it mirror neurons? What's all the science behind that? How does that work? How does that play in? And of course, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because you're getting the whole effect. And if you surrender to that and let yourself be in it, it's going to give you an incredible ride, an incredible ride, whatever the ride is. If your ride is relaxation, maybe you're chilling to some binaural beats and, and you're just in this inspirational place. Or maybe you're doing uh, like singing bowls for meditation and you're in that very um, slow effect, just trying to breathe slowly and bring yourself to a, a very meditative insight, place of insight. That works too. So choosing your music, of course, it's important, but also bringing your intention to it, to open to it consciously and say, hey, okay, I'm in this place. And we all get that, dancing, meditating, moving, exercising, whatever. The more obvious ones, we get those. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, man. There's so much more below that to be able to unpack and dive into and be able to figure out how, how Bill resonates in this particular musical moment, how Brandon resonates in this particular musical moment. And because we're 7 billion something like of us and the science is that the music we love is our most powerful music, the music you love is going to be different than the music that I love. Even if we love the same piece of music, its effect could be slightly different on us. And that's so cool. That's so cool. Fortunately, you know, there are lots of bands with lots of fans and we can say, hey, yeah, Beatles, we can all generally agree that yesterday is a pretty cool song. Now, its effect might be different, but it's a pretty cool song, right? So we all get that and we all appreciate the Beatles for having written it. So there are large chunks of people that, that already band together around this stuff. And going to a concert, man, it's one of the most beautiful experiences because nobody tells you what to do at a concert. And yet somehow or another, you all do it together. You know, the lights all come on at the same moment. There's even been places, I've been, I went to a, I don't know, I think Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young or something at the Hollywood Bowl. And there was a moment where everybody just spontaneously stood up, joined hands and started singing. Like, whoa, this is happening. How does that happen? <laughs> like nobody tells you to do that. I'm incredibly jealous. That's probably one of my uh, favorite bands. Man, it was so cool. <laughs> that, but it, Power of music though. Power of music, right? And man, if you can use that, if you're the band on the stage and you know that's going to happen, oh, you can deploy that in places where people need to join hands and sing together, right? Exactly. I, with intention. With intention, you're bringing about thousands of people and even not even looking at event, everyone present. If you just look at the power of music of how you're able to connect, heal, transform everybody, when you think about you've touched millions of years and you've been able to completely change them. That's what I think is so cool to see as you hear people saying, oh, this person's music helped me take this next step or do this within my life, which is so beautiful. It, it, it shows how it's not just something to hear, it's something to transform somebody. Yeah, it's definitely a tool. And I, we've left trauma until now. But when you go through growth, I mean, growth is the effect of facing trauma head on and wandering through it. And it's not a one-time shot. <laughs> you know, trauma comes to all of us because that's how we grow. Well, it's one of the ways we grow. I mean, there are the fortunate few who can meditate and grow that way. But for most of us, it comes in the form of something that's hard, a difficulty, and often traumatic difficulty, starting with our birth. That's a traumatic experience. But it's necessary, right? We have to be born in order to be here and live. And we deal with that for the rest of our lives. So especially when it comes to intervening with trauma, wow. Do you remember when the, uh, it was the last, yeah, it was April 15th last year when the, when the roof of the Cathedral of Notre Dame burned mm -hmm. and there was nothing that anybody could do, just sort of watch it burn. Yeah. One of the things that happened was Parisians came, they went in the streets and they just started singing spontaneously. They just like stood there in the street watching their cathedral burn and singing. 
And I'm like, what a great response because there's nothing you can do. I mean, there you are, this thing that is important to you and beautiful to you in whatever sense is, is burning and you can't fix it, but you can stand there. And in one sense, that's a, a whole different thing than rubbernecking. It's just going, yes, we're here, we're observing, we're holding the space for this event that's happening that we can't control. And they did it with music. It's like, whoa, what a great response to, lo to let those feelings be there and show up and, and, and sing whatever it is you feel in that moment. That's, it, that's a response to trauma right there. Yeah, it's, it, it speaks more volumes than any type of, you know, statement, anything that can be said. It shows the power of community, if that everybody's in it together, you know, and this is what the first step is in, in healing and going through this process, which is, which is so important. And, 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 and looking around the, the world, how we respond, you know, generally to like a school shooting, what do we deploy? We, we deploy therapists, you know, to the school. Maybe we should be deploying drum circles or, you know, deploying musicians who can come in and, and sing with everybody. Uh, it, it's really, um, it's noble that we want to care, but oftentimes the care that we offer is not holistic in the sense that it doesn't reach us at a place where we really hurt, you know, and maybe that, that hurt is something you can't see or you can't even touch or even talk about sometimes. Trauma is something that's very difficult to, very personal to be able to bring it even to a therapist, let alone to a friend or a spouse or somebody who's close to you. It's difficult to unpack. There's risk in that, right? So, but music invites us to that place. It, it, it's really well said. I think it's so important because as you see, especially today, I mean, there's so much talk therapy going on today, but there's so many people held back from that approach. And I think what you're doing, what Music Care does is kind of, it's the first person really taking that step outside the box of saying, you know, here's another approach. Here's something that we should consider because like you're saying, it's, it's building community rather than having a one-on-one -on -one approach of saying, you know, going through therapy, this is what you dealt with. This is how you need to face it head on, heal with it. You know, there's other ways of healing. There's other means of healing. And as you said, 7 billion people, we all have different approaches of going through things. We all don't have the same way of healing, the same way of processing information. Music can be that tool. Music can be that answer. I hope we see that throughout more of these, these responses. Hopefully we can gain a better sense of community through music in times that we need this healing and times that we need this approach. You're a very wise man, Brendan. Thank you. Well said. Thank you, Bill. I, I, I appreciate you sharing this information because I was so intrigued on how this can be such an imp impactful approach to just people's health and wellness and bringing people up from the ground. We spoke a little bit about some of the thoughts, behaviors that can be transformed, but in terms of you know the impact of music, what skills can be really benefited, what skills can be grown, what skills can be curated through the impact of the music care, of the music therapy that you provide, obviously, other than great dancing or the ability to feel comfortable within your skin, what kind of skills do you see throughout um, some of the people that you help? I love this question. There's so many people right now working on things like gratitude and kindness and compassion and empathy and being authentic. And those are growth skills you get to a place where you want to be able to be more authentic as a person, or if you're a leader, you want to be more effective as a leader. And what we're finding now, um, thanks to all kinds of research from all different fields, that being kind is, um, is a best practice. It really works. Well, duh, of course it works. We, some people have known that, but the thing that's different is we're bringing all of these uh, soft skills into a place where there have been the opposite kinds of skills. So business for a long time, for example, has been all about win it at all costs, you know, be number one, we'll crush the competition. And guess what? That attitude, it's not working so well. We're in a place where we want to reach across and, and collaborate and actually work with other businesses to achieve something together. So we've gone from this 
I don't know, a kind of an era maybe of competition, the industrial age, into an era of cooperation, of collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that's really leveraging things. We're really getting to a place. I, I look at uh, like the, the fight between Walmart and Amazon. Who's going to have the biggest delivery and robotic force, whatever. It's like, you know what? Go for it, guys. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really make much difference to me if I'm like living in a tent <laughs> and can't get delivery. What I want to see is that they team up together to help the world rise above its whatever issue it might be. And maybe that's just giving money back. Maybe there's other things about, you know, Amazon that we can deploy. And in a certain sense, there are. But aren't we starting to see large corporations pushing back against um, things that are conflict-based when it comes to dealing with uh, cloud storage, for example. Well, I don't want my stuff in the same cloud that's, that's also harboring defense department uh, you know, data. So people are becoming conscious and aware and pushing back on some of that stuff and saying, no, I'd rather have my data stored here because Brendan's got a cloud server you know, and we work together well. So why can't I put my stuff over there, right? And use that cloud service that's, that's more aligned with how I feel as a collaborator than is how I feel as a competitor. It just changes, changes everything. And <laughs> do we need to connect? We need to connect. I mean, brother, let's talk about it. We can't afford in this world anymore to be at war. It doesn't do anything for people to fight one another because there's so many other things we need to cooperate on. I mean, here we are, you know, saber rattling when we've got to deal with climate change. Or here we are, uh, you know, watching Amazon and, and Walmart and whatever and Google just go through the roof and yet we've got people living on the streets in the same town where they're headquartered. <laughs> this is not the way things work. You know, that's not rising tide lifting all boats. And I'm not talking about this as a socialist. I'm just talking about this as things that are the right thing to do. Like you've got a brother who's hurting. Why wouldn't you want to help? Right? You're so right. It's, it's something that needs to be brought up because, you know, if you look all throughout the country, there's, you know, where I was uh, stationed for the past four years um, at college in Boston, so many homeless people. If you look at San Francisco across the country, it's having one of the worst crises right now. I believe the, roof. Yeah. the city is spending about $4,000 around per homeless person there. And mainly that's to keep people from not going to homelessness. They're providing housing and paying off some of that, you know, debt that they have within the house to keep them from going there. But there's still rising populations on the street. And like you're saying, we look at, our economy, we look at our organization, it's, we're providing money in, in different means where we have people, we have like your, we have military veterans, we have everybody out here who are experiencing PTSD, experiencing so many mental health challenges. We have so, so many issues of, you know, X, Y, and Z of there's trafficking going on, there's X, Y, you know, it's, we need to put our funds in the right place. And, you know, as you're saying, it's, it's grounding ourselves. It's, it's saying what's, what's going to be first, you know, are we trying to help ourselves? Are we trying to be selfish or are we trying to help others? And I think that's one of probably the most important things that I've really learned is when I went on a service trip, I went to Guatemala and I mm. basically built homes for families that didn't even have the ability to have them. So we raised the money for them. And this is a house that I'm saying is maybe a 10 by 10 structure. It's, it's a room and they're forever grateful for us to do that. And that was able to ground me to say, what am I doing having like this material item here when I don't even need it? Why, why do I have this in my belongings when I could provide any help or provide any type of resource for somebody else to, to lift them up. And when you're able to see that people are experiencing such challenges, especially when you experience some challenge of, of yourself, it really grounds you and it, it gives you that perspective that we have so much healing that we need to do, not only within ourselves, but within our communities. And we need to definitely take those steps further um, as soon as we can. 
I love all the effort that's going into the uh, the soft skills world right now and how music aligns with that. And I also love as people are becoming self-actualized and self-aware, how they're saying, you know what, the American dream, the house, the picket fence, the two and a half kids, that doesn't make so much difference to me. I'm really in this for the experience. Look at the van life movement, you know, people going nomad, <clears throat> people traveling the world, um, people who pick up and move like having made successful entrepreneurial adventures in America, leave and go to places like New Zealand and become a hermit and write up, you know, blogs all the time. It's like, yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's expand this out instead of refortifying ourselves within our American dream or, or whatever your paradigm might be. And that's really encouraging to me to see that we're moving away from collecting stuff to becoming more interested in experience and uh, global experiences. Yeah, you've been to Europe, you know, it's like, it's like, yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's find out how other people are doing this thing called life and what's important to them. My wife and I, over the holidays, started to listen to Nordic folk music. I know people, hello, but this is not the kind of thing that you think it is. Uh, if anybody knows the pentatonics, there are groups in uh, Sweden, Norway, who do that close harmony acapella thing. And yeah, you can't understand the words. It doesn't matter. The music is just transcendental. It's beautiful. I never even thought of that before. And I'm a musical guy, right? So I, I like collect music, but Nordic folk music. So the, the opportunity to find out about how it's working, you know, in the other parts of the world and what matters and what's important to people who live there, who choose to live like in darkness eight months of the year. <laughs> how does that work? This is a fantastic opportunity that we have, uh, thanks perhaps to the internet, Airbnb. I mean, we can do this in a way we've never been able to do it before. So lose the stuff, <laughs> you know? It's not about the stuff. It's about this. It's about our connection, our interaction, and who we are connecting to and interacting with and how cool those people are, whether they're homeless or blown up veterans or, you know, CEOs. or People are starting to realize this in a beautiful way that's, that we can enliven. And being in the place of enlivening that with music, that's really exciting for me because music is that universal thing, right? So we can get together whatever language we speak. We can get together. I mean, hey, I, I would go to Norway today to hear a concert of any one of those bands that's in that playlist. And it's over eight hours long and it's getting longer. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it lights me up, right? Let's get lit about stuff like that. We, we really should. And it's, it really shows how universal approach it is, even as as you said, I was, you know, grateful enough to be in Europe. And as I was traveling throughout Europe, I hear American music going on. Yet a lot of the people who are there don't speak English, at least for some percentage of them um, who, who are older. And, you know, it takes me aback of like, hmm, one, like, why are they listening to it? But then I think like, oh, they might just be truly enjoying like what, what it has to come. There's so much more than just listening to the lyrics and then I was, you know, obviously brought up to many different cultures, many different, like their own music, their own genres. And then I was able to see, okay, like I, I understand what their perception is because before I traveled, it's not like I was going to listen to, you know, Spanish music or listen to music from uh, Greece or Turkey, you know, but then I'm, you know, brought to this, this perception and see how powerful it can be. And people saying, oh, you need to listen to this Turkish song or this Greek song. And then it's like, okay, like I, you're able to see how universal it is. And it's, it's truly beautiful to, to experience that with other people as well. And the, the heart thing, you know, connecting with people at the heart, that's the thing that comes first because that's where sound goes like into us. And then once you look around your room, you go, oh, dude, we're listening to this klezmer music together and everybody's responding the same way. Then you kind of like want to reach out. And, and make the mental connection, right? Say, hey, this is so cool. Is this band like here all the time, <laughs> right? You start to do that thing, but it starts with the heart. And, and clearly that's where sound and rhythm go. It's like they go into us at the gut, the heart level before we actually make a choice about thinking about it and doing something with it. So yeah, th your mental insight for the day is that it starts somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And, you know, I, I really wanted to uh, speak about this, you know, as, as I researched um, yourself, Music Care, can you explain the Silver Bullet playlist and explain how someone can create this, this playlist for themselves? If you think about movies you like or novels you've read or even the last TV episode you watched, there's an arc. You start out at one place and then you go up this ride to the climax or whatever it is, and that leaves you in a different place. 
And a silver bullet playlist is a structured way of being able to do that with any particular thing. Could be just feeling something like feeling joy or like I did with the homeless people, feeling loss. So four songs, and they can be any songs you like, but uh, the first song sort of introduces the issue or the feeling or whatever it is you're processing. Second song expands on that, just like if you're watching a TV episode, things get complicated. <laughs> then by the time you reach the third song, the climax, that's where the, multi, the, the maximum tension is there. And whatever that tension might be, sadness, joy, laughter, um, trauma, whatever, third song is your peak. And then the fourth song releases that. It's all about tension and release. So a Silver Bullet playlist builds you through a structured tension so you fully em embody the feeling or the, the task or whatever it is that you need to do, and then lets that go. So you release it back and reach a place of sort of neutral, a neutral effect where you're able to choose your next feeling. So there's a short, very short compressed uh, idea of a Silver Bullet playlist, four songs that lead you on a, on a particular journey. Wonderful. And, you know, you're speaking about trying to analyze lyrics and try to kind of use it to go through an experience, have, have a journey per se with this music. What are some of the benefits of lyrical analysis and, you know, how do you use that within music care? Lyrics are fantastic things. Um, and I love the fact that you don't need to necessarily know what they're saying. And this comes from like listening to all that Nordic folk music. There, there's music in other languages with lyrics and you get it somehow, you just, you kind of know what's happening because of the musical structure of the song. But lyric analysis, so uh, there are a lot of poets out there, uh, Leonard Cohen, um, some of the songs written by the Eagles. I mean, th th there is just, there's so much poetry that if you took the music away, it would stand alone as a beautiful piece of insight. And to put music to that, whoa, I mean, that's supercharging things. And then there's stuff out there where it's just like lyric jam, um, I want to think about freestyle right now. Everybody knows what freestyle is, right? This is, this is improvising rap. It's, it's really amazing. You put on a beat and just go. And some of the freestyle battles you can hear on, uh, what is it, Hot 97 out of Brooklyn. Whoa, man, these guys are improvising at levels that are genius. They're just genius. How do you analyze that? But the idea is, is to pull it apart and say, within the language itself, there's music. The, the words themselves have a kind of music. And if you sort of back away from what they're saying, what the, what the meaning of the words might be, and just start to appreciate them as sound and as rhythm, you get a different insight than if you just heard the words. <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite bands called Thumpasaurus, they're local out here in LA. Um, their words are like crazy. They, it's almost meaningless, but they're so groovy that you just jump in and you start like rapping along with them. And it's such a great feeling to be in that place. And the words are the vehicle to the feeling or to the point or whatever it is in a way that they wouldn't be if you took the words apart and said, well, this is total nonsense, <laughs> right? So you've got the sublime and the ridiculous, but the function, the function is the same. And I, I, gosh, I know. So I'm a writer too. And like all writers, I've written poetry. And it's like very difficult to intentionally put words together so that they mean something important and they withstand the test of time, you know? And I mean, we're still analyzing Wordsworth and Chaucer and people like that who wrote hundreds of years ago. So uh, I know I'm taking a pretty lighthearted approach to this thing called lyric analysis, but there's, there's such beauty in it because if you really pick it apart, you can get to the rhythm of the language and how that syncs up with the rhythm of the music and then you can get to the meaning of the language and how that syncs up with the meaning of the melody, the melody of the harmonic structure that, that is carrying that meaning forward. And if they're both working together, wow, that's beautiful. That is to totally beautiful. And then you've got things like the blues, where the words have a completely different meaning and, and emotion than the music. <laughs> and oftentimes, they're opposite. Like, the music is sad, the words are happy, or the other way. So, uh, you know, this, this whole idea of analyzing how the, the words fit, if you will, within the song it's so crazy and, and so beautiful. It just, it, it, it blows your mind in a way if you get into it as you know, clearly I've had to do through education in other ways. So I find it fascinating, but that, that mental piece, remember that's just one part of it. You still got the physical, you still got the emotional, you got the spiritual and all of that is knocking on your focus on the lyrics too, saying, Hey, we're out here too. There's meaning beyond the meaning of the words in this that's happening right now. Right? So there's my short form of lyric analysis. It shows you how complex it is. It shows you how much 
like you said, there's, there's still to be done. We can still, you know, interpret, analyze any type of lyric today, any type of music, poetry, so forth, that can all have different meanings to us. And, and that's the beauty of it. That's why it shows us as well how complex our mind is, our brain is to, you know, take in these signals, take in these words and provide different types of emotions, behaviors, thoughts throughout this whole process. And you could even have a different experience through a song at different points when you listen to it, whether you're around different people. So it's truly all all unique in and of itself. And, and that's why it can be so powerful because each experience can be a new opportunity of growth, which which is so, so helpful that we can have because it's such a therapeutic tool for everybody, whether you have a mental health challenge, whether you are homeless or whether you're the richest person in the world, you still can use music as a tool to heal throughout any type of challenge because we're all struggling with something and we all kind of need something to, to bring us back, to, to ground us, to, to center ourselves, which music has the power to do to really fully encompass this conversation, what you do today, what you've done, what you've learned, but then bring it into the context of what you could do. I want to wrap up this interview with this question at hand of, if you were to be given an undisclosed amount of money, as much as you really could have at your disposal, where would you allocate these funds in order to take the next step of music therapy beyond what music care is today? Where would you kind of bring about the next step in order to heal the masses of our world besides the community at hand that you're working with? Wow, what a great question. Coming for, from where I've come from and watching the uh, the structured disassembly of music in public education. Uh, I think the best thing for cultures that don't have music as a part of their core values uh, would be to reinvigorate public education in some way with music. Um, that's coming. You hear about the difference between STEM and STEAM, science, technology, engineering, and the missing A, arts, is often left out, and mathematics. If we could put, make sure that art is a component of every science, technology, engineering, and mathematics-based uh, program, that would do so much. Because there's nothing like learning as a child to be open to the arts. And the power that the arts have to inspire us is, is it's phenomenal. And I think it's a crime to leave that out of education at an early age. Opening up kids at that time is so much more uh, doable than opening up adults later. You know, so we need to get onto the primary side of education. I think with unlimited money, that would be the place to put it. Find cultures where, where music and, and art are missing from primary education and fund them. That will help so much. That's wonderful, Bill. I, I appreciate that response. And I think that would definitely do, you know, a substantial amount to the way that people can use music as as this tool for growth, whether it be through challenges or whether it be learning new skills, as we said, it, it brings about better thought processes, better behavioral actions. There's so many benefits to music, not just healing. And I think that's that's been shown today. That's been shown in this interview. And you know, I just want to thank you for taking this time out with me. I'm going to provide all the resources that you spoke about uh, within the show notes. We'll have all the links towards your work and people can be able to get in contact with you. We'll have so much more to talk about to continue within music care, but I think this gives you know, a brief introduction to what you're doing today and how you're helping out so many people who need music as as this tool of healing as this tool of growth as this tool to make the next step within their life so i thank you for not only the work that you do for being here today and for sharing your wisdom your time with me today bill i appreciate it well you're so welcome brendan thank you for being gracious and offering this program as a place for people who want to explore music more deeply thank you all for listening to this episode Please be sure to like, subscribe, and review to this podcast. 
Let us know what you learned from this episode and what you would like to hear in the next episode. This has been your host, Brennan Catulli of the Mental Insights Podcast. Have a wonderful day.